For me, the pace of technological change has always appeared to move incredibly, achingly slowly. As I grew up in Northern Ireland, I wanted to live in the future, not live in the past. And that's a feeling that just hasn't quit. Now, I get some perspective on life from my daughter. Indeed, only a week ago, she arrived into the room and said, Dad, I've just seen the craziest thing. Said, said there's, there's a TV channel, and on that TV channel, they show videos from YouTube. They're mu music channel, you know, and there's lots of adverts, and you can't skip things or move around. And, and the craziest thing about it is you have to pay for it. And I said, what is, what is this thing? And she said, it's called MTV, and it is bananas. Yeah. <laughs> and it's those kind of conversations that, get, that bring perspective on the speed at which novelty becomes defunct, the pace at which new ideas and new technologies will enter the home. And so what I wanted to talk about today was more a ramble through 20 years of a personal reflection on technology. As I look back to me as a teenager, you know, I began to get excited about things. I get, began to get excited about the relationships between people and technology. I began to get interested in scientific discovery and how ideas emerged from scientists and engineers and from laboratories and entered the home. And that set me out on a, on a path of discovery within innovation. Now, whilst I was studying science and a bunch of other stuff, I'd, I got a job carrying the bag of a man called Professor Ernest Shannon. Now, Ernie, as he became to me, was a great friend, great mentor. He was a man from Ballycillan in North Belfast, and he'd been at the helm of British gas. He had uh, looked after the Royal Academy of Engineering. He had inadvertently created the UK's first mobile phone network because he wanted a, the ability for engineers to talk to one another whilst they were on the job and solve problems together. And his job was to set up the first science park in Northern Ireland and to create an environment in which people could develop new things from science and technology and engineering. And he had a passion about a great many things about the potentials of nanotechnologies and biomedical sciences, genetic engineering, how different materials might influence different types of, of industry. And you can see echoes from his work all around us in public policy, in the environment, in the streets that we uh, walk down, in the, the job advertisements that, um, that we will see every day. That is, has its origins within work that was completed 20 years ago. Now, he told me a couple of, couple of things. Um, first was that innovation is all about people and it's very, very little to do with technology. Um, indeed, you know, it's people that make change in society. It's not technology. Technology is a tool that people use to get there. And he also highlighted that there was a great interdependency between those people, between the scientists, the engineers, the policy makers. And he put those people together on a process of what he called technology foresight to develop better public policy in Northern Ireland. And again, that has echoes throughout our society today. Now, whilst I was carrying Ernie's bag, I was also completing an MBA in, at Queen's University. And I was much more interested in the tech stuff than the business stuff. And I really struggled with my MBA thesis. And so I decided, well, what I'll do is I'll go out and I'll speak to the chief executives of Northern Ireland's companies, the top 100 companies, about their attitudes and interests in science and engineering. So that's what I did. And it started with this quotation, the idea that, you know, in the future, there won't be technology industries and non-technology industries. Actually, everything will be enabled by technology. And so the first company I went to see, it was one of Northern Ireland's largest companies, didn't own a computer, not a single one. This was the height of the dot-com bubble only 20 years ago. 
But yet there was an interest, there was a shared interest in the potential that science and technology, and particularly the internet, might bring. And through that process, we were discovering that actually, innovation is not something you can do on your own, and it's not something you can do to somebody else, but rather it's something that we do together. And we create new ideas, and we have those insights with one another, and the dialogue with one another. Now, I was getting very excited about technology, I was getting very excited about the internet, and I know a bunch of other people were, and so I put a conference together. So I organized Northern Ireland's first innovation conference. And I thought, God forbid anybody would have to come to a conference and listen to me. So I emailed a whole bunch of other people and asked them if they'd like to come. And the author, Douglas Adams, said yes. So he arrived in the international airport and burst through security and said, I've just been to California and it was amazing. And I said, why? So he said, he'd been to Apple and, and they've, they've discovered a new design philosophy. They have this means of, of understanding, caring about how people will interact with the device in their hand and what that might mean. And then to simplify everything around that experience and about the aspirations of the individual. And in doing that and in solving problems, they never set aside the context in which people were experiencing the problems, the frustrations they had with technology. And then he told this story at the conference as an opener. But as a closer, he told the story of the great Irish elk. Now, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating thing. The great Irish elk is misnamed, not least because it's not an elk, and it's not even Irish. It's actually a great deer. It was the greatest deer to ever walk the earth. It sat over two meters high at the shoulder, and its antlers were four meters wide. It wasn't Irish. It lived all over Europe and North Africa and parts of Asia. But the peat bogs in Ireland preserved its skeletons perfectly. And so you'll see, for those of you who visit the Ulster Museum in Belfast, you will see a skeleton of the great Irish elk. But the story he told was more about its extinction. The idea that the great Irish elk had developed larger and larger antlers as a means of attracting the opposite sex. The problem was those antlers got so large that it couldn't have sex. Indeed, it could barely walk around and certainly couldn't forage for food. So it became extinct. He talked about the trajectory of evolution the idea that through a period of time, this thing that had been attractive to that great beast had become an inefficiency in its evolution. And he urged people to set aside past trajectories and look at themselves, to reflect on themselves and to reflect on the ways that technology might change the things that they wanted to do. Now, my career in technology ended almost as soon as it began. The internet um, bubble burst. And so over a period of autumn 1999 to autumn 2000, 75% of internet-based companies evaporated. And not only that, you had diagnostic tools disappeared, medical devices disappeared, and this caused a great disruption in the path of technology development. Now, Northern Ireland was fairly well preserved from that, from that process. The technology um, uh, capability and capacity in Northern Ireland was still relatively small at that point in time. But it did have an impact on the education system. There were schools across Northern Ireland that dropped computer science because it wasn't a viable um, pursuit. Careers teachers advised people not to pursue technology and computer science because there were no jobs there. And that took us about 10 years to recover. So I needed to find a job too. Now, at the time, Tony Blair was the Labour Prime Minister, and he'd made an agreement with the trade unions to create a defence diversification agency. The idea being that over the course of the Cold War, some 10,000 scientists and engineers had been amassed to solve problems relating to the Cold War, had developed carbon fiber, liquid crystal displays, had taken satellites into space, 
and sensors on the ocean floor. The idea being that we would transfer these from the defense applications and put them into the hands of society. Now, our first attempt at doing this didn't go so well. We took out ads on the side of England's black taxis that screamed, test us, almost as if we were channeling the A-team. You know, if you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find us, you might want to come and talk to us geeks. And people did in their thousands. And as we scanned through thousands of inquiries, we started to discover a lot about innovation at that point in time. What we were discovering was not only is innovation not something that people could do on their own terribly well, but we were discovering that those technologies that were in a rush out into the, into the marketplace tended to fail. What we were finding was that those technologies and the science that was being conducted that could help people in their daily lives, that provided better clinical outcomes, better creative outputs, those technologies that were finding a role in society were the ones that succeeded. The third thing we learned, though, was there was a great dependency on the universities. On the research clusters, the individual academics upon which these ideas were being developed. And we begin to see a change in the role of the university within society. Now, I came back to Northern Ireland. I took a job as, as a director of innovation, first director of innovation at Ulster University, and also took a seat on the board of Invest Northern Ireland, the Economic Development Agency. Um, and being the geek in the room, any opportunities that washed through Northern Ireland tended to stick to me. Now, at that time, there was great vibrancy in these halls. We had a first and deputy first minister who got on together, who traveled the world together, that told the Northern Ireland story remarkably well. And as a result of that, people wanted to come here. And those people who came here, we met, we talked to, we talked about how they might find a space within, within society. And one of the first people I met was chief executive of a large technology company that now employs several thousand people just down the road. And they said, we really like you people because you get the Simpsons. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, we, we understand, you understand the subtleties, you know, and if we're going to build technologies together, then we need to be able to communicate effectively. And we went on to talk about research. And I realized in the conversation that we were having a research conversation about research as a means of talking about something else. When I talked about research capacity, specificity and output, what they were hearing was that there was a mass of skills that was fit for purpose and was very productive. And it was only much, much later that I recognized that this global war for technology skills had begun. Now, a few years later, I stood down from the, the board of Invest Northern Ireland, and a thought had been stewing, had been bothering me for some time, it was in relation to Brexit, and I'm sorry for being the person that brought that up. <laughs> but I felt that Northern Ireland was a much more fragile place than our presentation out to the world. There were problems there that I felt an exit from Europe could destabilize. And not just in business or in the education system, but in society at large, you know, pretend, there was a potential for a deep regional recession and ultimately the potential for civil unrest. And so I wrote this article and a few days later somebody picked up the phone and said, um, you know, we're trying to keep Northern Ireland in, in Europe and we wondered if you could help. So I did, I turned up. They didn't ask me to do the thing I was going to do, which is why I went along in the first place, but they gave me a t-shirt and they sent me out to the market towns across Northern Ireland. Now, once a researcher, always a researcher. So I standardized my, standardized my question set, I interviewed 200 people, and I wanted to find out what people thought about all of this. Of the 200 people I spoke to, 136 of them wanted to leave the EU, and I really wanted to find out why. First person I spoke to 
we ended up talking about science. It was nanotechnology on the day. And he said, you know, I have, I have great interest in science. I said, great. And he said, you know, and as we know, he knows, um, science fiction becomes science fact. And as we know, he knew, that in any science fiction, there is a dystopia, and that dystopia is promoted by a European superstate. And that's why he wanted to leave Europe. The last person I spoke to wanted to leave Europe because it would accelerate the prophecy of Daniel. Now, in between times, there was a whole lot of other reasons that were slightly less bananas than those two positions. But in the course of all of this, I was reflecting back on the internet, on the internet's role in promoting common views. And I reflected on a, on a manifesto that had been written some years previous by Jaron Lanier, who had said in his manifesto, you're not a gadget, you know, there's a great danger in the thing that we're doing on the internet at the moment. We're designing social media platforms that are ironing out diversity of thought. We are designing things for the things in the middle, and in doing that, we're eliminating digital humanism. And so, people are aggregating around common causes that don't actually fit their means at all. Um, and those ideas and the voices of, of experts and individual views get ironed out completely. Now, in the midst of this chaos, I was doing the day job. The day job, part of which is trying to find people to back the ideas and ambitions of scientists, of our graduates, and the people we work with every day. One such phone call happened two years ago this month. And in that phone call, um, I was trying to pitch an idea. The venture capitalist at the other end of the, the call said, actually, yeah, I really like this idea. I think it has mass appeal. They were proven to be correct. But actually, we don't want to pay the university for it, and you know, we just might as well go off and do this ourselves. I complained about this, and they said, what are you going to do, start your own venture capital firm? So we did. Um, and it's called Enbar, named after the mythical Irish horse that could traverse land and sea. We called it that because we wanted to back people's odd ideas. We wanted to back the ability for people to engage internationally, to work in diverse teams, and to work with peoples of, people of other disciplines in a way that we could not find funding readily. So back to my daughter. So I talk to my daughter about technology an awful lot. Um, we talk about computers, we talk about the fact that um, there are technologies that are developed by machines, that actually this has the great potential to disrupt the world in a whole lot of very, very interesting and odd ways. We came to a conclusion. The conclusion being, you know, in the future, everything is going to be creative because the machines will kind of take over themselves. And it was almost as if there were echoes of that Michael Porter statement 20 years previous. You know, in the future, there'll not be the creative industries and all the other stuff. Everything will be necessarily creative. David Bowie, when he was promoting heroes, David Bowie said, tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. Now, David Bowie was not only a master of artistic reinvention, but he had this ability to listen to things in the wind, to see signs and weak signals not only in music, but also in technology. He was one of the early proponents of the internet, in fashion, in sexual liberalization, in our understanding of gender. And he packaged these up in, an art, in his artistic way and presented it out into, into society. And there's a lesson in that pursuit for each one of us. Now, in closing, I, I wanted to make three quite modest points today. The first is, we are all connected. 
And that creates an interdependency between us. And we've got to recognize that. And we have a responsibility as a result of the community that we are creating, both out in society and online. Second is, in the way that we design and develop technologies, those have an impact on people's lives in good ways and in bad ways. And we've got to recognize our responsibilities. The final point, throughout history, our, our progress, the enlightenment that we have had, have come about through not only our ingenuity, but our creativity and our humanity. And we who are developing technologies, who are engaged in research, have a responsibility to ensure that we do not design out the things that make us special. Thank you.